There's a lot of wet that already. Is happened. that the official no. time? Alright. Just gotta turn it on. Are they on? Okay. So let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have two public hearings. So I make a motion that we open the first public hearing, the local law to override the tax cap levy limit as established in general municipal law 3-C. Second. Okay. Anyone want to make a comment? No? I'd like to make a motion that we, um, I think we have to keep this open. So keep it open until March 9th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that this does not mean our plan is to go over the tax cap. This is just a safety net in case we need to. But the plan is to not um, go over the tax cap, which is because of uh, the low inflation rate, only 0.12% right now. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we open another public hearing. It's the local law regarding the proposed amendments to the NBR code that we've discussed. A second. Anyone from the public would like to comment? Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we keep this public hearing open until our next meeting on the 9th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Great. Um, Okay, some items to add to this agenda. Um, I really only have two things. We can add them to the end. One of them is uh, I was looking for board support to write a request to the DOT to update some village roads. We could put that at the very end of the meeting. And I was also looking for official board support um, that we have our planner investigate options for the Trees for Tribs program. So those can both be added to the end of the, the agenda here. Excuse me, Mr. This is, that last item is just for the, pla the planner to investigate something? Yeah. Why do we need to approve that? Um, really just to give folks a heads up, it's a, it's a program outside of, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It seems to me that you would just make that as an announcement that he's looking into it and that would be good enough. I've just included it as a discussion item that doesn't require action. Great. How's that work? That's fine. Okay. okay. I'd like to address uh, item number 10. Um, I'd asked for and got a lot of information on, on this item, the approval of sewer district number 7. Uh, there's some other information I'd asked for and hadn't yet gotten, and uh, I don't want to hold things up over that. That was the uh, information on uh, what we've historically spent DPW on sewer repairs over the past couple of years. If I have gotten that information and I didn't see it, I apologize. Um, so if it's not um, time sensitive that we do this tonight, I would like to receive the information before casting a vote and having a discussion. If it is timely, I you know, certainly have another, another possibility. I don't want to hold things up uh, or be obstructionist. I would say it definitely is time sensitive. Um, the DEP project is very anxious to get a little clarity on um, sewer options for the, the property off of Paradise. Okay, well, my main concern is not with, uh, with approving uh, what's before us right now. My main concern is looking forward and future capacity for our wastewater plant. So I'd be, um, if we can horse trade a little bit, um, I would really uh, like to see a discussion of the town village water agreement on the next uh, joint town village meeting for discussion. Sure. I, well, that's you, you, yeah. Don, that's you, had also, you had also you had also made you had also made a suggestion that I thought I was going to bring this up when we 
got over it, but we can we can do it now. Um, we can do it now. You made a suggestion, and I think I'm interpreting it correctly. You were um, suggesting that we create an addendum to the 2007 sewer agreement. So I, I think the way it currently reads, like if you took like a really draconian approach, that if there's capacity, the village has to provide it. Um, I would be very willing and interested in um, adding an addendum that says, in addition to, sure, we can't provide capacity unless we have it, and we have ample capacity, and that has to be signed off on by our engineer. I wouldn't mind also saying, you know, let's let's uh, be mindful of what our planner would be thinking in terms of um, potential development in the village. So just as an addition, and I and I think that's. That's, that's along that's, the lines that's of what of you what, yeah, yeah. articulated in a in a note. Um, so we can have that discussion tonight in in association with item number ten, or we can have it. It really is a town village issue, so I thought it would be efficient to discuss it at a joint meeting. But I just want to discuss it. So I, I, I would I like to. to uh, I'd, I'd like to support the idea of having it uh, on the agenda of the town village joint. Uh, you, some sort of modification to the 2007 yeah, yeah. sewer agreement. Yeah. Sure. My own, my own preference is as we get less and less capacity, that the price go up. Right. That, that's just one one suggestion. But we can we can trade around lots of ideas. But I think we need to look, the per, look the, the percentage future. goes up as the capacity becomes less and less. If, for instance, the town wanted to develop something and use additional capacity in our sewer plant, the charges they would pay would get higher and higher as capacity got lower and lower. That's just my, you know, just one thought. I think that's definitely um, an, I, a, an idea worth exploring, and I feel like we have an excellent water and sewer attorney who will be very good at making some suggestions in terms of, well, like, this is how you could schedule it if you want to, you know, phase in um, price increases uh, depending on volume or, you know, he'll, he'll have some good suggestions that we can we can and, consider and the information that I'm seeking on repair repair expenditures is more germane to that long-term discussion than the item on the on the agenda this evening. So, um, fortunately, be, yeah, yeah, most yeah. of our most of our repairs that have taken place are water or are not sewer related. They're water related because um, most of the sewer work that we've done in this community over the last few years has been paid for mm -hmm. by the um, small cities grant. That we've been awarded five out of the last six years. Okay. Well, I look forward to that discussion, and uh, thank you for okay. the back and forth. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, I didn't have anything else to add to this agenda or change it. Um, I did have one announcement before we go to public comment. Any any anyone else have a uh, an agenda change before we? No. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. We accept this agenda as amended. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Announcement. Um, last week, there was a developer before our board <coughs> giving a presentation on uh, the net zero apartment complex. And um, we were discussing the affordable housing requirements for that project. And he had read the code, and he was under the impression that the requirement was 15% of the units be affordable. And um, I actually pulled out my phone during the meeting and, and read from it from the E code at the time. And uh, it also said that the requirement was 15%. Because that law was originally written um, during Jason West's first administration in 2006. And then there was a uh, litigation that challenged that law. And then I think the law was thrown out. But it was actually still in our code as 15%. And then um, in January, or it could have been February, of 2015, the Village Board changed the affordable housing law. So it's actually 10%. So we were all incorrect on February 10th, because we were looking at e-code that had not been updated yet. So I actually contacted the developer to give him a heads up, because he had been planning for 15% of the building to be affordable housing units, and he actually is only required to have 10%. But he can um, still do 15%. He, I, I actually, I told him exactly that. He is <laughs> welcome to do 15%. He could be Prefer extra it. compliant. Um, but I wanted to mention this publicly, since 
I mentioned this mistake publicly yes. um, last time. So has the code been updated? Yes, if you if you you know pulled out your phone and looked at e code right now, it would say ten percent. Okay. Whereas on February tenth, it said fifteen. So that's the only announcement. Anyone here for public comment, or anyone else on the board have an announcement? No public comment. No. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and number two on our business agenda, we have a discussion with uh, a couple of folks regarding the Millbrook Preserve and whether to pursue a conservation easement or parkland designation. So Marty and Christine, right? Chris, you guys want to come up and, and chat with us? Grab a microphone. Okay with you, we sit here and stand there. What, whatever you, wherever you feel comfortable, as long as you speak into the mic. Oh, I'm loud. So. No? Oh, that's for reporting purposes. Yeah, yeah that, the, so not that we would do, but that the public would do. I get it. Got it now? Got it. All right, let's go. So uh, conservation easement versus parkland designation, what are the pros and cons to both? Sure. Uh, and maybe just a, a little bit of background. Um, last year, uh, the town and the village entered into an IMA regarding the Millbrook Preserve and in, to cover the circumstance where an application under CFA would, were not to be granted, um, how do we make sure that the land nevertheless gets preserved in perpetuity? And uh, we wrote into that IMA that should we not get the CFA grant that by not later than June 30th of this year, each of the town and village would place conservation easements on their respective parcels that make up the Millbrook Preserve. Um, what we have since learned from Christy, and I'll let her speak to it in detail, is that there are costs associated with that, and they're not insignificant. Um, it could be up to $11,000 due to, and I'll let again Christy discuss the details of her Wolka Valley Land Trust's approach to this. Um, there are no funds this year in, in the town's budget. And one could say, well, Marty, you were honchoing this. Why didn't you see that those funds were in the budget? I didn't. Um, so what I have suggested to our town board is that we postpone uh, when we place a conservation easement on the property. Now, this is not exactly addressing your question of conservation easement versus on parkland designation. I have, I have a question about that eleven thousand dollar number. Is that an annual cost to it? One shot deal. Okay. That is a one shot deal. Thanks. Can we get a payment plan? Absolutely, but it has to be made by the time we close at the easement. What does that mean? Close the easement. Close means a legal signing of the document that we have to have all of our funds in place. So we sign the conservation easement as a legal document and we file it. We have to have all of those. I think Don was looking for like a 30 year mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> we charge interest. No, I'm kidding. So this has to be the next budget? Yes, for, for the town. Um, and what we have done to try to explore what are the relative merits of using a conservation easement as the vehicle to protect the land in perpetuity versus using parkland designation, which can be done by local resolution. Um, we've talked to, or I've talked to, Christy is already quite expert on this. I need to become more expert on it. Um, spoke with Bob Anderberg from Open Space Institute, Seth McKee from Cena Cutson, who's also on the town's Clean Water Open Space Protection Commission. Kara Lee, who is with the Nature Conservancy and also on the Sea Wasp, um, and of course with Christy. And what I have heard from all of those folks is that either one offers some advantages, but considering our particular circumstance where there are other properties adjacent to this that are under conservation easement, and to assure that it is in perpetuity that conservation easement rather than parkland designation would be the preferred route that they would When you recommend. say other properties, you're talking about the Woodland Pond owned property? What other properties have conservation easements? 
Well, um, I thought he was referring to other properties that they might want to add to this, but yes, Woodland Pond has a conservation easement held by the Walker Valley Land Trust, and then on the other side of these properties, Poets Preserve is a 12, uh, almost 20 acre property that we put under conservation easement in December. Is that uh, next to the Millbrook Preserve? Yes. Uh, it's owned by Peterson and Roloff. So we just closed oh, on that, so that easement in December of 2015, and part of the conservation easement that we worked out with them is no development is allowed at all forever on that property, but they are amenable to trails. I thought Poets Preserve, so that's a separate SBL, but I thought that was town property. That is owned by Roger Roloff and Barbara Peterson. It is not owned by the town. Okay. There is, Tim, another contiguous piece that is owned by the town, uh, and it's contiguous to the village's parcel, not to the town's parcel. It was um, granted as by Dave Lent, um, so that could potentially also be included uh, in, in the Millbrook Reserve, although there isn't anything that has been done to, to affect that. Uh, it could be putting off um, any action will allow us to explore whether that can be done so that we don't then end up with a third conservation easement and a third fee due to um, Walker Valley Land Trust to, to conserve this. Isn't there some challenge with the conservation easement uh, that Woodland Pond currently has and that like if you read it, it's, uh, it says limited public access. I think we've actually had some discussions, like if we want to do what we would really like to do with the Millbrook, that conservation easement would need to be amended. So what happened with Woodland, all of our conservation easements are absolutely very specified to the property. Woodland Pond is a, it's a private entity. It, an easement doesn't require public access, so they, can or cannot allow public access. If they want to make their properties public access, we can amend the easement or they can just change their policies. It, it doesn't impact the easement. It, things that are on conservation easements have to be things that we can monitor. So they can allow public access. We don't necessarily have to amend the easement. I, I think our community would be very interested in asking Woodland Pond to amend that easement because that property is right next to the, the properties that the town and the village purchased, and how would we then only have um, limited public access to the Woodland Pond property? It seems like we would be setting ourselves up for some trouble. That's more of a management with Woodland Pond than an easement question. It, it allows for it trails, is. but the easement, if you do read it carefully, doesn't say public is not allowed because it's not something we could monitor. I can't go out there and say if it's public or residences using the trails. But it definitely says limited public access. And that's something that the, the property owners did want. Um, we, we could change that language, but the property owners could allow public access and it's They would not, have to amend their, their conservation easement. It, it wouldn't necessarily require an amendment of the easement, but we could explore that further. What do you mean on your expertise? What are logistical issues with having parkland next to easements? What's the, what's the problem? So while parkland does designate land and spe specify its use for a permanent time, it can be removed through legislation. It can. It's not forever. And the definition of parkland means for recreational use. Um, it doesn't protect the conservation values, which is my understanding of what Millbrook Preserve is meant for, to protect the, the habitats, the important aspects of that land. Designation of parkland doesn't protect that whatsoever. Conservation easement absolutely does. Um, we say what can happen where, when, forever. So you can only put trails in X, Y, Z. There can only be a nature center in this area. That's defined and that's set in place forever and we do not go backwards. Designation of parkland just says this can be a rec recreational area. This can be used for a recreational center. And my understanding of this is that that could mean it could be ball fields, basketball fields, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's far different than a conservation easement and through an act of legislation that can be reversed. So that's what we get for $11,000. Like and forever, which then yes. becomes my problem. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. a one-shot deal. So, the, so the, 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 the thinking is, let's say the current town board and village board are 
very comfortable and committed to preserving conservation aspects on the Millbrook, we don't know what might happen with future government entities, and they could change something via a legislative action in Albany, change the parkland designation. So there or, could... or just even, even, like you said, build a, uh, you know, some other, like, baseball fields there, because that would fit within the parkland designation. Ten, ten, 20 years from now, what you all think is best could be very different from what other folks think is best, where as a conservation easement, what is defined stays in place. We can only go more restrictive. We don't go backwards. And the but IRS makes sure of that. We should also, we could also investigate uh, pursuing parkland designation and then coming up with some other local laws that say it has to be preserved in a certain way. Absolutely, but local laws can be changed. By the next, so or a subsequent government. I'm not trying to be difficult, I was just answering your question. Right. <laughs> it's like when the president takes executive action, the next president can, can undo it. It might be worth discussing just briefly what that eleven thousand dollars represents. Um, there's a thousand. It's eleven thousand per property, though, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. It, uh, unless we were to. One so of we're our, talking about three properties right now. Uh, just two, the town's sixty-three acres and the village is sixty. What about acres. Poets Preserve? That's already conserved. It's already conserved. Yes, there's okay. already a conservation easement on it. Uh, so, so those $11,000, Christy, correct me if I misspeak, uh, $1,000 of that is associated with drafting the conservation easements, and, and they would be the same, presumably, or almost the same for the town and the village. And then there's $3,500 of that that covers stewardship in perpetuity and monitoring. And there's $3,500 that goes into um, leak, a, a fund for protection, legal protection. Conservation Christy. defense, and I'll take it from here. Sure, so uh, 3500 of that goes to our stewardship. We go out and check on every single one of our conservation easements every single year, forever. 3500 goes into conservation defense. That's our legal. If we have to go to court, that's, that's what that money is, is involved in. So it's basically a total of $7,000 that's invested forever that we uh, use to take care of our easements. And that final um, baseline documentation is generally 1,000 to 1,500. It depends on how complex these are. I need to further investigate that. That's what that kind of wiggle room is between the 10,500 and 11,000. For a baseline documentation report that documents what the conservation easement is, what the property is, and it's what we use to actually go out and investigate the property. So we go out, walk the boundary, walk the easement, one year it's fine, the next year there's a Walmart, we have a problem, we have legal documentation to go and take you to court and, and, and actually deal with that situation. Walmart's my example, I'm sorry. And then $1,000 of that is the closing. That includes our title search, our title insurance, all of our, our stuff that goes into that. Um, we don't consider that a cost because that, uh, we call all of this a re requested documentation because that is for most of our other landowners a tax deductible donation to the land trust mm -hmm. but this costs us money I don't make any money from this and then we're stuck with keeping track of this forever watching this forever um, it, it's it's not a deed restriction it's not something that three years later someone can come back and be like oh I was just kidding can I really no this this is filed with the DEC, filed with the state, and something that we monitor every single year forever. If the Walker Valley Land Trust ever ceased to exist, all of our easements go to a like-minded organization. One of the other benefits of having the Walker Valley Land Trust um, hold the conservation easement is that should there be uh, an encroachment, for example, it, and it was identified through somebody monitoring the property, let's assume it was the Walt Hill Valley Land Trust, and we paid them every year some nominal amount for their time to go out and do that monitoring where they do an encroachment, they would simply notify the municipality that there was an encroachment, and it would be the municipality's obligation to spend monies for legal costs to assure that the encroachments were removed or, or the other any other issues. By doing it the way that Walker Valley Land Trust handles it, all of those expenses, should there ever be any, would be borne not by the municipalities but by the Walker Valley Land Trust out of these funds that go into the legal defense fund. Correct. So unless you yourself are violating the easement, 
it's our problem to help you chase after your neighbors. But if you violate the easement, we come after you. I have a very interesting job. Anyone else have questions? No. So what are our next steps? Are, are we supposed to? Uh, there is one other thing I want to uh, mention by parcel. So it's, it's not, if the village owns some land, the town owns some land, we have to do the easement per landowner. So the village can own four parcels that are part of this. That would be one easement. The town, one easement. We can't do one easement for town and village. You're two different, two different, different landowners. Owners, yeah. You're two different people. It's but like a marriage. The village it's, only owns one. So property. town would be one, village you own two parcels, be one easement for those two parcels. I can't combine it. If you if there was one owner for all of this, be one easement. So let's let's say hypothetically uh, we pursue an easement, we pay for it, and then next year we purchase another property that's contiguous with, with the property we already own. Is that another $11,000? It would probably be less. I would need to go back to my board because they'd probably be hitting me right now for quoting, but we would need to, in the very least, make sure we have some of our stewardship and conservation defense. We, are, we amend easements to either make them more restrictive, to add on land, to do things like that. But again, I have the IRS and our legal fees over our head. We take this on forever. So we have amended easements to add on land, and we usually then take on some some of the funding to cover some of the costs. I don't want to say it's eleven thousand dollars. It would be a lot less. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, it's not a magazine sale. I've got to kind of work out. And and we also maintain a national conservation defense insurance program through Terra Firma, and we are now, as of today, an accredited land trust as well. As of today. The announcement went out this morning. The Walka Valley Land Trust is accredited land trust through the National Accreditation Association. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's what the permanent smile that makes you look slightly psychotic is about. They've been working on this for two years, three years? Oh. For, for a long time, but two years very seriously. And we are part of uh, 341 land trusts out of the 1,700 nationally that are accredited. So um, we're not messing around. We're here to stay, and, and we take our work very seriously. Uh, we have fiduciary responsibilities which require us to think of thoughts like this. I just want to put this out as having been thought about. <clears throat> it occurred to me, is there, would there be some way to, Start here. between now and enacting this, to combine ownership of the property, have the town own all the property, have the village own all the property? <clears throat> Besides that being unsupportive of the good work you're doing, which strikes me as good work, worthy of support, <clears throat> I think the logistics and the costs of of that sort of transaction would really pretty much outweigh the benefit. But I just want to throw it out there that it was a thought I a th a thought I had, if we could combine ownership. But I'm sure that would cost several thousand dollars in closing costs, have, legal fees. I'm sure we would have both of those, as you mentioned, because we're, you know, we have a, a, public, a municipality alienating property. Mm -hmm. So we would have to go through the legal steps to alienate yeah. But someone out there is asking why would they want to pay eleven thousand dollars twice, the town and, and the village, and that's the answer because I think so because we would be paying somebody else. Yeah. Instead of paying the local well, land trust, we'd be paying our lawyers. Um. Anyone else want to comment right now? The only other thing I wanted to add is that you, it's not a lump sum. You can do payments. Sure. And it would probably take, I think Christy has suggested, maybe five or six months to go through this process. So your payment plan could be stretched over five or six well, months. Plenty of concerns our budget kicks in. in the of, of course. And as I shared with you up front, that, that's a concern for us in the town also. Uh, and I had previously suggested to the board when this became an obvious issue was let's put it off until the fall. And, and Dan actually suggested let's put it off until we get through our next budget cycle so that we can budget it in that cycle for tw the year, our fiscal year starting in January 2017. Which I totally appreciate. I just want to make sure you guys also build in the time if you want to do an easement that we can actually do the easement process. I don't want you to set a deadline and say, okay, Christy, do it in the next 30 days. It takes some time. So. Okay. And you do know that the town and village have set different budget cycles? Well, oh, yeah. And so is the land trust. So oh, believe me, it's all fun. Yeah, I get it. So but that, I just wanted to remind everyone that they might come to a decision, but still give us some time to actually do this once you decide. Because um, there's some negotiating. The easement itself, um, I need to make sure that both parties are OK with that. And while you all are working together, great. It, it, it's a big, lifelong decision. So so 
uh, I do this with landowners every day, it, it's going to take some time. Um, to be totally honest, I'm not really sold on the idea of, of spending this $11,000. Um, I spoke with Bob Anderberg, the, the attorney who represents OSI, and encouraged him to be as candid as possible. And I asked him, like, why not just pursue the parkland designation? And he's like, you could definitely do that. He's like, do you, you know, the vibe that I got was that would not be an irresponsible path in terms of protecting and preserving this land. As designated parkland, the process is fairly straightforward, as I understand it, easy to do. But as Christy mentioned, that would not prevent there being ball fields or other kinds of recreational facilities developed on it at the whim of a future board of trustees or um, council for the town or the village. So we're, we're using that ball fields example, but the, the 65 acres that we purchased has wetlands and the topography just would not, you know, even make ball fields a possibility. And, and I feel like our community um, was very supportive uh, about the idea of purchasing these lands to preserve and protect them. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, public sentiment changing and elected officials saying, well, let's do something completely different with this land, which is not even, I, I don't even know if it would even be feasible considering its topography. One of the th several topics that um, I discussed with Bob Anderberg, um, comparing the two and what are the pluses and minuses was that I asked, well, what if we were applying for grants in the future? Um, would one versus the other be more beneficial? And his response was Desig designating it as parkland would not be as beneficial as putting a conservation easement on it. And again, I know you probably think that I'm biased, but I, I did research this to understand it further. While there are a lot of wetlands and important habitats now, and I know the community and this board and the town board feel strongly, that doesn't mean in 20 years from now, give 20 years of dry seasons, that they could change their mind and, and really change the topography and change the decisions of what happens on that land, whereas with a conservation easement, there's no going back. So. Um, I, I agree with what you say. I, I like recreational lands and, I, and whatever those mean, but uh, designation of park lands mean that it can be used for a playground, neighborhood rec center, open space, and open space is not defined as protection of anything. It can be all made into an indoor rec center um, without any restrictions to protect wetland or open space, so. Well, I, uh, I I'm kind of favoring the conservation easement, but you know, I, I could, I'm open to the parkland thing as well. The one thing I think we should do is make a decision on which way we want to go sooner rather than later so that everyone knows where we stand. Um, I also couldn't imagine a New Paltz government in the future going after this land for some other purpose, but there's a lot of things I can't imagine. I couldn't imagine the possibility of President Trump. You know, I mean, there are things that, that happen that we, we couldn't envision. And uh, so I, I like the perpetuity, but um, and I could live with either, but I think we should decide, you know, if not tonight, we should, we should decide sooner rather than later. And, and the decision that each of our boards needs to make, in, in some ways, taking no action, it's because the IMA stipulates conservation easement by June 30th, 2016. Um, my, my, it, it, in some ways, you'd ha we'd have to get both boards to agree to go the parkland designation route, um, not just one board or the other being able to unilaterally change that, uh, that agreement. Oh, so, okay. So it's not the village can do its thing with parkland and you can do the thing with your land? Th that's correct. The well, I then we would just somehow be in violation of the IMA. I don't know what that would mean, but I think that's what you're suggesting. Well, I'm not suggesting being in violation no, of the IMA. No, you're saying if we were not to pursue a conservation easement, then we would be in, in, in void of the, the IMA or defaulting on the IMA. Unless both the town and the village were to mutually agree to I, a modification. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, let's put this on our, our uh, March 9th agenda. Discuss it again then. Thank you. I'm enlightened. Yeah, I'm excited.
Can we have uh, Marty and Dan stay at the table? Or Dan come to the table? <laughs> Um, the next topic was suggested to me by our, our fire chief, Dave Weeks. He thought that there's an opportunity for the fire department to save money if we use um, town highway employees to do repairs, just basic repairs on some of the fire department vehicles. And that would not be a more complicated uh, repair or or maintenance need that would potentially uh, void a warranty. He was just saying, you know, versus taking a fire truck for some general maintenance to a, to a, a third party mechanic, yeah. that if we used, even paying the, the town DPW guys, um, like time and a half or, or whatever they would, you know, they would be paid outside of their, their regular responsibilities, he anticipates that there would be savings so I was going to float the idea that we pursue some sort of MOU or IMA with the town government. Um, and I, I had our attorney look at this, and he asked um, our insurance company, and that was the response that, that he got. You know, for routine maintenance, it's probably fine. You know, definitely not for anything like uh, if it was required maintenance regarding breaks that would uh, Void a warranty, so that's the idea. Any comments? Well, let me just guess: is the justification that the town maintains its own vehicles and the village does not? Is our DPW not? No, no, that's just for fire trucks. <coughs> well, I, I understand, but why why can't our D DPW do it for extra? Um, I don't know that our DPW. You know, this. I, I think what you're bringing up might actually be interesting uh, in terms of. Yes, I believe the answer to your question is that our DPW does not perform general maintenance on our DPW trucks, but I'm not certain about that. We can double check, because maybe that would make sense too. Like our, our highway department, our town highway department definitely performs maintenance on vehicles. Well, and it's a question, it's possible that, that our village DPW is not interested in that work. I mean, it could be that they're, they're you know, maybe the town is interested in the village isn't, but I just think we should look to our, look in-house. We'll, we'll double check. I, I don't believe that we have a, a mechanic on staff as part of our, our DPW. Well, that's what I figured. Whereas the town does, okay. they have. Well, that would be the justification. Yeah. Let's just check. But let's let's. Um, so I just wanted to throw that. Up. But that's a that's a great kind of indirect suggestion. Let's see if there might be an opportunity if we were to pursue an arrangement with the town. Um, could the the town also perform general maintenance on you know the the, the village pickup trucks as opposed to mm -hmm. going to a third party. So I'll, I'll I would investigate think that a little bit more. We want to touch base with Chris and make sure that he and, and wouldn't Luke, see yeah. issues yeah. with doing that. Yeah, I believe Chief Weeks has because he works for the Town Highway right. Department. That's where he came and up with this idea. We may hear a real quick, short answer. I've already explored it, and that's yeah. fine. Because yeah. there are lots of ways. Obviously, we know that the village and the Town Highway Departments are finding ways yeah. to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly like that idea of continuing to work together as both governments. Um, obviously, we'll have to talk to Chris, but what I will tell you that I will do is that tomorrow we have a town board meeting and we have committee updates, so I will certainly let the town board know at our public meeting that this was um, something that was brought up at the meeting. We'll move on from there, and it sounds like a great item for our next joint meeting as well. Let's do, keep talking. do we have uh, uh, an IMA now where we uh, formally uh, Exchange services between our two departments. I don't. I don't believe so. We just we do it informally. informally yes. I believe non-formal. Yes. Okay. Well, I believe part of the paperwork on the proposed water district five does involve that that the the village would maintain the system. Is that? I know I read it somewhere. I, was, I think I think it was in that uh, proposed agreement. So there is not now, but there is one okay. being worked on proposed. When For water lines have burst, they no, work together. I don't to mean I don't mean uh, generally. I mean I was actually thinking about vehicular okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's lots of informal agreements. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know if Blue was in a situation, he picks up the phone and, and calls Chris, and the town highway department will will 
quickly lend a hand or equipment. I think they do that for each other. I, I think other DPWs, yeah. even outside of, of yeah. New Paltz, do that. That's kind of very common with highway departments and, and public works departments. I would do nothing to interfere with yeah, we don't kind of informal way. Yeah. But this, this, makes, this seems like um, a little bit different in terms of we want to formalize it because it's, it's um, related to you know, specific assets that we can anticipate. Um, maintenance needs for. Yeah, it would be a regular expense as opposed to an emergency situation. Yeah, yeah and, and with all of that, I think one advantage also would be the distance traveled in order to get our, our uh, fire trucks repaired because very often they have to drive a much further distance. Like um, Erickson's is the closest place that they use, and then um, I'm forgetting where the other place is. But it's definitely a much further distance. So, you know, it's it's also the time taken in travel, um, getting the, the trucks there, getting them back. Okay. So you guys are going to share that with your board. We'll do a little more research on this and, and see if, if, if it makes sense. Okay, next item. Um, Thank you. Rebecca, do you have anything? Uh, are you familiar with this uh, sponsor approval form, the service award? The fire department? Yes, it's pretty general. It, it basically, um, it's, it's sort of like a, a part of um, like an insurance um, piece for uh, the firefighters um, where they get credit for their volunteer hours. And it, it's just pretty much a general approval each year. Okay. But we have to approve it. Let's put that on our next agenda, because, and Ryan, can you track down the, the documentation for us to review about that? Okay, um, next item, uh, plastic band bag enforcement. Don had some, some thoughts on how to beef yeah, that up. We passed a law last year, and, and uh, it's coming up on the one year anniversary. Um, I was thinking of, of what is the most efficient way to actually enforce this law, and we have a code officer who has big items in front of him, such as, you know, I think when uh, we all saw how, how key his role was when there was a horrible fire on Mulberry Street in the aftermath. Um, so we don't necessarily want to burden the, the code enforcement officer with, with walking around looking at who's... <coughs> if you're tuning your, your guitar, that's a C. That's a perfect C. Really? Think so. So. That last part's a screaming <laughs> That's true, that's true. So we have a model with our Shade Tree Commission, where I'm a, I'm a liaison, where if there's, a, if there's an issue, it comes before the commission, and if there's a problem, if someone takes down a tree that they shouldn't, or they, they violate our code, uh, the Shade Tree Commission will evaluate that and, and refer to the code enforcement for, uh, for enforcement. So I was thinking of the same thing, sort of thing, where we publicly put out information to the public. If you see a violation, mm -hmm. let the clerk know. The clerk will pass it on to the EPC. I'm thinking that a really good symbolic thing would be we hand out citations and enforce that law one day a year on Earth Day. And on that day a year, our code enforcement officer takes all the complaints and rights, and that's, that's what they do on Earth Day for part of their day, and I think that would be a, an, a, an efficient way to actually get this law enforced and put a process in place which doesn't burden uh, the building department and the code enforcement officer. So Don, are you suggesting that if our code enforcement officer d determines on May 1st of any given year that someone is violating the law, that we should wait until the next Earth Day to actually you know, I hate these reasonable but annoying questions. That was, yeah, that's 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 unforeseen consequence. No, good good question, Dennis. Uh, no, I'm not suggesting that, and, and uh, perhaps uh, um, emphasizing or formalizing the uh, the Earth Day aspect is probably unwise. So, you know, I I, I yeah. love the idea of tying it into Earth Day. That was part of you know rolling out the law in the first place. But if we have a law, we should be enforcing it year round. I do like the approach of using the EPC to not overburden. Our uh, code inspectors, but yeah, no, I, I, friendly amendment accepted. But I thought you were—I I thought I also heard you were just suggesting that we schedule at least one day a year where our building department is proactively going out. So it's right, isn't? 
but the language I used didn't, the way you put it just now is better. When, yeah. I, when I said it, I said they, they enforce just one day a year, and that really wasn't my intent. So, so, it's so we proactively one enforcing one yeah. day a year. Yeah. It's the day when that will be the, the enforcement focus. Yes. Every day the law is. Okay. So uh, the EPC is meeting tomorrow. I haven't actually shared this idea with them because I had it since the last meeting. So I'll bring it up to them tomorrow and we can let, find out how they feel about it uh, when we meet next. So are you envisioning though, so let's say it's that one day per year when we, when we want our building department to go around and, and just check in with local businesses. Is, is that the, the thinking? Well, if it's similar to the, the way the Shade Tree Commission works, and I don't know what it, it necessarily would be, but the Shade Tree Commission would get in charge, would get in touch with the violator, say, hey, you're in violation, you know, get your act together. And if that doesn't happen, that's when the code enforcer would actually write a, write a ticket. So okay. I, I wouldn't envision the code enforcement officer getting involved until and unless we had a situation where the EPC had notified the business owner and they had not complied. But are you, are you thinking of having the EPC folks go out and proactively do that on Earth Day? Or? No, I, th I think by phone calls or by emails. So EPC, EPC can do that any time of the year, yeah. but, but your idea of designating one day per year where we ask the building department to say, hey, can you focus on this for? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can envision that there wouldn't be more than you know, three or five businesses at any time that would be in that situation. But yeah, that's, that's what I would envision, that we would schedule whatever actual citations need to be written would be scheduled to be written on that day or at other days of the year. I as just call it a special emphasis day. Thank you. Great. I, I, like I, think, I think it's a good idea generally. I mean, you could do a yeah. special emphasis day uh, for a variety of laws, sure. right? Like, sure. I, I, I yeah. think it's a good, uh, good idea. I just it's like special cool. emphasis day regarding the plastic bag ban will be yeah. on, on Earth Day. That yeah. Okay, well, we'll, we'll let me, let you me. You guys play with, we'll play with, with suggestions. suggestions and bring it back to you. Yeah. Um, six. Six. We're going to have a discussion about the Environmental Conservation Board, which is currently tasked with looking at land use applications before the Town Planning Board and what our village environmental policy committee does and my thinking has been to basically strengthen both of these boards to give them both more authority and more jurisdiction where the currently the ENCB is just looking at um, land use applications before the town planning board so let's amend the ENCB so it can include both town and village residents and task them with looking at land use applications before both the town and village planning boards. And then also broaden the scope and responsibility of the village EPC so we could have, well we currently can, um, well, so it could include both village and town residents and that's really a policy and advocacy currently uh, a commission but it could become a board but the focus is to do more stuff like the plastic band bag or you know look at a, a variety of broader environmentally related initiatives um, so giving both the ENCB and the EPC broader mandates and so if the EPC comes up with um, some suggested legislation they can then take that suggested leg legislation to the village board or the town board. And I think we, uh, I think we agree, uh, Tim, you and I, on, on the goal. Um, there's a couple different ways to get there. The, um, the Environmental Policy Commission was envisioned to move into that role of reviewing items for the planning board. Um, and we, as of, uh, I guess today, I just received from uh, Laura Heady at the uh, DEC uh, the instructions on how that could happen, how the board could morph into, or how the commission could morph into a board. Um, I think a combination of the two, two concepts that, so what I'd like to do, I'd like to maybe by next meeting 
just resolve this and pick, pick a plan, because I, I don't think there's any bad plans. Um, I also saw an email from uh, Rachel Lagatka, who had been chair of a previous version of a Village Environmental Commission, and, and she had a third suggestion. Um, so I think we all have the same goal, and I, I'd like to maybe just try to schedule a discussion where we, where we settle this. Um, in my perfect world, we could turn we have a we have a we have a uh, a commission now an environmental policy commission which will be fully constituted. As I understand it, there are six people interested. You know, there are two open open seats and three interested parties uh, right now, so we should be fully constituted. I'd like to add, add the the board responsibility and review of planning board stuff to the the village group because it's there. It's 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 fully constituted. And I want to support it. But I'd like to see if maybe some of the town members of the ENCB who are willing to work with, with the village could spend six months mentoring them in the secret process. I think the, the real advantage of using the, the town ENCB is they have a lot of knowledge and experience in going over secret issues. And I always say that wrong. But I, so I think there would be a learning curve if we use the village group. But if we have members of the town group who are willing and qualified, I think they could, they could work with our village board, our village group, pardon me, commission, and provide the training. Um, Rachel's suggestion, looking at, at what the requirements are, was to have a three-person board. And she volunteered herself and Miriam Strauss to sit on it. And they're both very educated in these issues. So there's a couple different... A three-person board for what? Uh, a separate board, separate from uh, environmental policy, specifically to review items before the uh, planning board from an environmental standpoint. To do that, that, that function that we want, that, that job that we want. So I, I think there's a, a... My personal preference is to use... You know, use not, not the band, use, use village people to, uh, to do this. So um, couldn't you accomplish the same thing if those three people just joined the ENCB and then that becomes a town village board? Yeah, yeah. I am, I, and I'm not gonna, not gonna mention the state of California. I have, uh, I have stated that uh, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's advantages to, uh, to having the village evaluate its own, its own projects. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying anything against the idea of, of having the combined thing. My, my preference is to, since we have a board or a, a commission that wants to be a board, we have members who are willing and able to, you know, respect and utilize the, the infrastructure we have rather than modify it. But, but well, you're, you're suggesting creating totally new infrastructure. That was, that was Rachel's suggestion. And I but I, I've spoken with Rachel, too, about this. And... Um, I think she's comfortable with the idea of joining the town ENCB. All she wants is is authorization to actually review the planning board application. She wants to be able to get the real documents that the planning board is looking at, so she can actually look at them. No, I think we all share that that, that goal. So, and there's currently three. Uh, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'm not sure I share that goal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> having uh, sat on the planning board uh, for. Uh, a fairly long time and uh, being the liaison to the planning board now uh, I'm not sure that the planning process needs the complexification of another uh, entity that gets into the uh, consideration of approval the planning board has the response and, and planning boards not, this is not peculiar to our village or the town. The planning boards have a certain kind of responsibility which uh, they seem able to fulfill not just here but you know across the state of New York without having this additional body to review what they're reviewing. But the, our town does. Our town has a board that reviews planning board applications and they then share their observations with the planning board, and then the planning board can do what they want with those observations and suggestions. I hear that. I hear that. But why not have another one? What do you mean? Well, I mean, why we have a planning board, and now there's yet another entity. Well, why not have a third entity that looks at it? Well, now I you're mean, being what's silly? No, I'm not being silly. <laughs> I, I think that there is a step that over complexifies the process of planning review. 
So are you suggesting that um, we're doing we, well we, now? We make a recommendation to our colleagues on the town board to dissolve their ENCB. I, I would not make any such recommendation. I'm now saying, why are we adding something? I'm not telling them to uh, subtract something, unless that you tell me that you know that their planning process is significantly more effective than ours, and has been over time. I have a three-syllable response to Mohunk. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't even reviewed by our planning board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, details, details Wait, now. I, I have a, mine, a minor response to that. I, I, I haven't got it all played out. I was on the planning board when two Mohunk first was presented to us. We did not look favorably upon that presentation. They then found a way to circumvent all of our efforts by going elsewhere and whether legally or not, and I know I'm on TV now, they got uh, their uh, sufficient approval for them to go forward. I don't know that that would have been stopped by any other process since they weren't coming to the planning board. So you wouldn't have had a planning board with an ENCB looking at the material. There wouldn't have been any material. I stand corrected. It was a great line, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let, let's not go down that rabbit hole of discussing. Okay, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> Too much. But I am still, I'm, uh, you know, I'm willing uh, to be a minority in this. Okay, how about, how, hold on one second. So let, let's, let's put this ENCB uh, review of planning board applications on the side burner for a second. How about modifying our EPC as it stands now, because I view it as a policy and advocacy board or commission, or soon to be board, and let's change it so it can include both town and village residents who are interested in, in doing policy and advocacy through an environmental lens. And then, also, and then also ask our colleagues on the town board to, to recognize that that board that has both town and village boards as uh, a board that they are required to um, open up the emails that re they receive from those folks <laughs> when they uh, have suggestions about legislation or policy changes, right? Because currently, like our EPC, you know, with the plastic band bag, the, the town board is under no obligation to, to listen to our EPC, but I, I believe that the village board is under obligation to, you know, hear a suggestion from our EPC, right? We don't have to act on it, but there's a, a mechanism for us to, to listen to them. So we could ask the town board to um, recognize this town village-wide EPC. I, I, when the idea was discussed with the EPC, there um, wasn't full understanding or a lot of enthusiasm, as I, as I recall. And I, I think if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. And I think at the very least, um, you know, if you want to expand the board to more members, we could talk about town members. But right now, we have two seats that are open and three, three interested parties of people who live in the village. So I don't see, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what's what's broken that we have well to what I'm suggesting is more than well what's broken is that we currently have no um, no policy and advocacy environmentally focused board or commission in our community that has a, a, a community you know, wide. yeah they're they're not there's no mechanism for them to go before the town board so that's what I would be suggesting is that we, we we're basically broadening their their mandate. I would think that the, 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 the EPC would, would be uh, very interested in, um, you know, given the chance to communicate with both the village board and the town board. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, that's the case. I'm not saying it's not the case based on the conversation 
that was had at the last EPC meeting. I don't know that that was the case then, at least. Um, yeah, Dennis and I were on the, the uh, village EPC, and I, I, I kind of felt like it was a handful just looking over the, looking over the village. Um, so I, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this, and I guess eventually it'll come down to a, a, a vote or something, because uh, you know, I don't think there's any, anyone's going to stop off and, and leave, the, leave the table over this. But we just have different views, and that's, that's OK. Anybody else want to comment before we move on? We'll, we'll just put this on the uh, comeback list for could, next week. Could, could we uh, ask a member of the town board who happens to be present whether this is of interest to the town, that they would have another voice? Uh, I mean, I know that this is our board, but... Yeah, I'm fine with that. Let's okay. I just wanted to note that the village board has now recognized me more than the entire 2015 town board, so I appreciate that, guys. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, too, that, and, and, and Tim, maybe I, I was confused in this. One of the other aspects that I thought you guys were looking to do is the fact that presently there is no review of uh, village projects by an environmental um, agency. That's always well. been included in yeah. my Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to reiterate that point as well, so I think that's a benefit. So I, I brought this up to our ENCB at our last meeting. We have another meeting on Wednesday, and I'm going to update the town board Thursday, and then we'll again bring it back to ENCB. And they were excited about the idea. They liked the idea of being able to review village proposals, and there were members of the board, too, who also are very much into a number of these policy issues that they presently don't deal with. In fact, some of them have backgrounds in that, but you know we don't have that mechanism right now. Um, so. I can only speak for myself, but I'm certainly very supportive of the idea, and a part of that support is also because the ENCB members are also supportive of the idea as well. So, Thank you. All right. So um, might it make sense for you to also see, take the temperature of your town board, you know, whether you would be interested in hearing from a policy and advocacy committee or board? Yeah, I, okay. I, I can certainly bring that up during um, my committee report um, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Well. If I could just say something. Um, the way that our, my, from my understanding, the way that our current um, environmental policy commission um, functions right now, we have commissioners, and each commissioner is able to bring on. Um, additional people underneath them to work on specific projects. Um, I don't recall what, what Research. the researchers, yes. Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible for one of our commissioners for, for now to take on, um, I'd say Rachel if she's interested, take on the task of um, reviewing um, items that are in front of the planning board uh, along with researchers so it, it would be a function it would basically be functioning like what we are talking about creating but it would still be under that commission that's a very interesting suggestion in that each of the environmental policy commissioners all have their you know core project that they function on so if we have somebody that's interested in making that core project then maybe that could be part of the environmental policy commission well as Don is suggesting so I think we have a number of good ideas on the table. Let's uh, try and pick one next meeting and, and uh, settle this. Because I, you know, I, think, I, I think we're all kind of more or less generally, you know, one, you know, on, on, on in the same book, if not on the same page. Sounds good. Um, I just added this to the agenda because Dennis brought it up. Um, so that's so. Let, let's continue that conversation on March 9th. But the the seventh item on the agenda, Dennis brought up this idea at the last meeting, so I just threw this on this agenda. I don't know if we want to talk further about it generally. Um, just to put this in the context as when I brought it up, I brought it up as a suggestion for when we have vacancies on our board that we are unable to fill. I'm not sure if the way this is phrased uh, really points to that. You know, I'm not necessarily interested in just opening up all our boards and oh, saying, I see. come okay. on all applicants. Yep. It's really, yep. 
we can't fill this position, let's expand our pool. Right. Because I would hate to be in a situation where we have vacancies and we appoint a few people from sure. the town and then somebody else from the village comes along and they're interested and now we have to try and juggle and wait. I, I see what you're saying. So let's put that on the next agenda yeah. to chew so, on. That seems like a... So basically a special circumstance. Correct. It's extenuating circumstances dictate we allow someone from the town. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of, we had an unofficial town resident as a researcher for the EPC, I want to say. She mm -hmm. was never actually appointed, and she was fabulous, and there was no reason for us to turn mm -hmm. her away. She was interested in working hard for us, so That's great. this should be applicable to all boards when there's a, a need. Well, in that case, you, you do not need to be a village resident to be a researcher for the EPC. Oh, okay. yeah? So that person could, yeah, yeah. But, but that, doesn't, yeah, that doesn't address the larger point. Okay, next item, um, I'm going to give uh, Tom a chance to comment on what he's read in the newspaper, the difference between the water challenges in Flint versus the water we have here. And I had asked um, Ryan to pull together some research. He's in the midst of collecting some information. Did you want to I don't want to say thoughts? too much. I mean, we don't have the same situation that Flint has at all. I mean, uh, the municipality had a relatively safe, secure, and treatable source of water uh, for a very long time. And then their uh, governor decided that monies could be saved by using a different and more proximate source. So they started taking their water from a more proximate uh, surface water source. And that surface water source was uh, significantly polluted, plus, they were running uh, evidently through uh, lead pipes that were causing uh, high levels of lead in the uh, bodies of children. Uh, we don't have we don't have that now, and we don't have any prospect for it that I know of, unless you know that we have significant numbers of lead pipes that are feeding our schools and homes. So what wasn't the challenge that they had lead pipes, but then they also started using a different water yes, source, they did. and then they there was a, a chemical, yes. a chemical reaction. They had a more proximate source of water that had many more contaminants in it. Yes. And one of the reasons I put this on our agenda is because I've had several people ask me, <laughs> like, what about lead in our water? So. Every year we have a report that is done on all of the elements that are uh, discovered in our water source, or sources, because we have several water sources. And we have a DEC report that lists, I think, in excess of 60 items. I, I, it might even be many more than 60. It's more than 60 at any rate. Uh, items and uh, it tells you what, uh, what levels of those contaminants are found in each of our water sources. And uh, I do not recall any year on which uh, we have had an excess except for turbidity at certain times. If they happen to be testing the water uh, at a time when DEP might be releasing more waters uh, there might be a higher level of turbidity, but not of any of the other contaminants that are found in the water. Well, I, I, have a, I have a friend who uh, administers a municipal drinking water system, and, and you don't get that job because you're a risk taker. And I think the people in Flint, the political process got involved in the administration of the water system. <clears throat> And they weren't careful, and there were steps that could have been taken if this were done properly and, and, and judiciously and slowly, which could have minimized these, these issues. And those steps weren't taken. We, we have nothing, we're not changing water systems. No. We're not changing, you know, uh, and, and so there's no possibility. And as I've seen at other, other, other times, the, no matter what the source is, <clears throat> the drinking water standards in the United States of America are the, are the envy of the world. And, Government broke in this situation in Michigan, but ultimately it was it was the standards that were that were being violated that 
that were able to to certify that, that the problem was happening. We, we, this is a whole different universe yeah. than, uh, than what's happening there. Okay, uh, next item, we started talking about it a little bit when we were um, modifying our agenda, but the adoption of Sewer District 7 with appropriate well, you conditions. Missed number nine. Number nine. Oh, did I miss nine? Yeah. Oh, okay, nine. sure. I can, give, I can give an update on, um, on uh, water infrastructure grant opportunities. Um, just this afternoon, I met with our grant writer, Mark Blauer. So we're trying to come up with a strategy to pursue grant opportunities or very favorable financing to deal with a lot of our outdated water infrastructure. You know, we've, we have a, a wish list of projects that total about four and a half million dollars. Um, and then there's a couple of other projects that We've identified recently, like the um, the I think it's about eight new fire hydrants that we need, um, and then another project that I'm very interested in is instead of using uh, potable water down at the wastewater treatment plant, could we have a, a system where we're taking the the effluent um, instead of spitting it into the walk hill, basically reusing it for operations instead of using potable water. I mean, the operations include just like rinsing down um, sewage treatment mechanicals. And um, our engineer came up with a, an estimate of about 90 to $100,000 to create a system where we could uh, use gray water down at the wastewater treatment plant. So the fire hydrants, wastewater treatment, plus about $4.5 million of various aged out water infrastructure um, so we've really got two things going on right now. Mark Blauer is going to contact USDA, so that would be the, the federal agency that could potentially provide us with grant money or some favorable financing. But what we really want to do, and I, I met with a, a gentleman who works at USDA, because one of the challenges with pursuing grants is the, the application process is just an, a bear and it involves a, a lot of uh, human power and um, engineering reports. Um, so what we're trying to do with USDA is to see if they will review kind of a stripped down application to see are we in the ballpark of being awarded grant money. And the gentleman that I spoke with at USDA um, said that that's definitely a possibility, whereas our grant writer has had challenges when he's reached out to other folks at USDA. So I put Mark Blauer, our grant writer, in touch with the, the gentleman that I spoke with, and they've actually communicated very well. And Mark is pretty optimistic that if we get the right basic information in front of him, we should have a better sense of whether we will be eligible for grant money for you know, projects that would be in the neighborhood of four to five million dollars. Um, and then Blue, our DPW superintendent, and Rich Ruth um, from Bernier and Larios are also taking a harder look at the, the wish list of water infrastructure projects that we have hanging over our head, and they're gonna do a little exercise where they prioritize and you know, really double and triple check, you know, which projects um, they, they feel are most important. Um, so we'll get some, some feedback shortly from USDA and feedback from Blue and Rich about what the projects will look like, and then we'll decide um, whether we're moving forward with even a stripped down application. So that's my update there if anyone has questions. Just one quick question. Um, the wish list you're talking about, uh I know one big thing that we're, we're facing is the uh, replacement of the pipes that bring water to and from the treatment plant up on Mountain Rest Road. Is that included in that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the biggest item yeah. on this wish list. I thought that was even more than $5 million, but I'm, I'm glad to be wrong. Um, it's a 12-inch water main. Um, so the, um, the water main that's really problematic now is between Canaan Road and the Morningstar development. That it, and it's really quite amazing. It, for all intents and purposes, it has failed, but 
is somehow continuing to serve uh, water districts, uh, a water district off of Calvin Pulfard. Um, and then the main continues um, through the Morning Star development, and that is fine. And so basically there's an enormous section that goes through the, the Humpo Marsh, which has failed. And yeah, the estimate that we have now is 1.7 million for, for that portion of this project. Thanks. Interesting. Um, I'm wondering with the gray water system down at the uh, treatment plant, if um, that would be something that we could pursue with the DEP as well, since conservation was part of their whole plan with um, the project with us. So the, 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 in my ongoing conversations with, with DEP and that project, um, so we have Peter Meyer from, what is the name of that company? It's the, the conservation firm that's trying to identify opportunities where we can save. So um, working with Peter to identify you know, where there are inefficiencies in our system or opportunities to, um, to conserve. Right. So if we have official recognition from Peter that there may be an opportunity, then we present that idea to the, to the DEP. It's, it's uh, you know, that's, that's what they've told me. Um, they were like, well, if you can get the, the conservation guy to say that there's an opportunity that's gonna save you money and is better for, um, you know, water conservation and longer term resiliency, we will listen, but it has to go through that, that protocol at this point. This is just, uh, I do want to bring up California. <laughs> um, you, you may be noting that in the papers now, there is a considerable amount of uh, emphasis in California on the use of gray water, and in particular on storm water runoff. And uh, California is going to invest a considerable amount of money in uh, cisterns as well as rain gardens in order to preserve as much of the rainwater as they can, because they know they will not have potable water for all of the uses that they had put it to in the past. So they have uh, achieved a savings already by conservation methods of 20%. 20% mm. over pa recent past usage. But they're going for much more than that because they need to. We probably don't need to in the same way they do, but it would be good for us if we could figure out how not to have all of the rain that's falling down now run on our streets and then run into some cistern maybe, well not a cistern, that's what I wanted to run into, uh, into a culvert and then into the river. There's great water going down a, down a drain right now. Cute. I can hear it. I can hear it. <laughs> and there's a really advanced uh, gray water program in Arizona. They have pink pipes. And you know it's gray water because the pipes are pink. And it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's in place, it's doable, it's... it's a, not, a not notoriously progressive place, Jacksonville, Florida, has a blue pipe system. Okay, same deal. Uh, a, a, it's called a three pipe system. They didn't want to be pink or something? They whatever, didn't want to be pink, whatever, they didn't want to be pink. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> So, but but um, since we're talking about water, don't don't those western states though? Don't they have more low-hanging fruit in that they just do a whole lot more outdoor irrigation? Like we don't we don't water our lawns the way they have been in the west. So when you're talking about a 20 percent reduction in water use, aren't they just like not doing as much outdoor irrigation? I, like it's it's more difficult for us to achieve that amount of savings. Because we're not doing silly things like, you know, watering lawns. Or, or growing animals, which of course is what one of the things that right. they do. Uh, irrigation in California is, uh, I think, more than 80% of the water usage in California is uh, agricultural. More than 80%. And oranges and almonds and other crops. For are example, very, very water yeah. sure, any sort of food production is incredibly water intensive. Water intensive, right? 
We love you, New Pulse Farmers. <coughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. Um, so next item, approval of a, of a sewer district um, that would serve uh, Paradise Lane. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, and this, is, this can kind of be pursued separately from the approval of this sewer district, um, but I do think it's worth investigating whether we could add an addendum to that 2007 agreement just to include something in terms of like it's not just about whether or not the village has capacity for town sewer districts but also um, could we have some sort of review from a planning perspective in terms of um, expected projects within the village I, I think language like that added to that agreement would probably be useful yeah, thank you for that and to frame the issue our wastewater plant has a finite capacity of 1.5 million gallons a day or MGD at peak times we currently use 1.2 million gallons per day not always that but that's at the peak and this project when we approve it with sewer district number seven will bring our capacity a little bit below 20 percent we'll have 19 point something percent left so as we look forward 15, 20, 30, whatever years, what we don't want to do is incur the expense for our taxpayers of building a new wastewater plant. That's a, that's a really expensive proposition. So as we, as we have less and less capacity, um, I think it becomes incumbent upon the village board to be more and more tenacious about deciding to surrender it for village development, for town development, for whatever. We just need to look at it as we uh, get closer and closer to that uh, capacity limit. So thank you. I, I appreciate that, Tim. So but I want to move this uh, item on the agenda. Right? Perfect. I want to move uh, item uh, number 11, which is the approval of sewer district seven and uh, continuing with the appropriate conditions as specified in the existing IMA dated 2007 between the town and village of New Falls. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Was that um, five zero? Did everyone vote? Yeah, I voted yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so I have uh, another up update regarding the MS4 compliance report. So it, it, it's fun learning all these new acronyms. Uh, NOI, Notice of Intent, I guess. Uh, about two years ago, our village board signed off on a notice of intent to comply with becoming an MS4 community. And um, on March 9th, it will be the, the two year anniversary. So basically we have a two and a half year period and that will finish up in November. Um, so during that two and a half year period, we have been designing a program um, meeting certain requirements as far as uh, <clears throat> public outreach and um, education for our highway and and village DPW staff as well as uh, you know all village staff we actually had this entire room filled with with folks when there was a presentation on MS4 from the county that was an example of, a, of an education piece but basically what we're in the midst of is designing a program uh, to be an MS4 compliant community. So after next October, our program will be up and running. Um, it's already up and running, but it's, it's still in the kind of design and creation phase. Um, yeah, there's, there's six measures total when it comes to being MS4 compliant. My favorite one was uh, identifying the illicit discharge detection and elimination. So you know, just noticing what's going into our, our stormwater systems and, and how to be more mindful of, and here's another acronym, POC, and they were throwing that around in the meeting, and I was like, what in the world is POC? And it stands for Pollutants of Concern. So our engineer uh, has been tasked with helping us identify these POCs um, as part of our our MS4 compliance. Um, so that's really just a, an update that 
we will um, we will complete this 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 latest um, milestone on March 9th and then we're going to have a report due by June 1st and at that time uh, there will be an opportunity for the public to ask questions and comment on that report. So, yeah. and what a nice segue it was from Tom talking about stormwater and cisterns to uh, to this topic. Just for anyone who um, is going cross-eyed at home, so we read, read two sentences from this uh, notice to frame what this issue is. Uh, stormwater runoff from urbanized areas have been identified as a significant threat to the water quality of our nation's waters. The Federal Clean Water Act requires municipalities which operate a municipal separate a storm sewer system. That's the MS4. That's located within an urban, urbanized area to obtain a permit to discharge stormwater. So we are meeting the requirements that we can receive that permit and continue to discharge. But the MS4 is, because it's, it's hard for me to remember it, municipal separate a storm sewer system. That's what the, uh, the acronym means. That's the, the king of acronyms, <laughs> <Yeah>. MS4. <laughs> um, so there's also a mapping requirement to be a compliant MS4 uh, community. And you know, as we pursue uh, GIS, uh, and, and another acronym, Geographic Information Systems, for, uh, to be used across our departments, both by planning, DPW. We'd love to partner with, with the town, the school district, SUNY. Um, so I'm working with, with um, the county as well, because the county already has a, a pretty significant GIS backbone, and, and they have said that they would be interested in investigating whether there's a shared service opportunity to help us create a GIS. So a GIS is a little bit overkill as far as these MS4 compliance requirements in terms of mapping, but um, I'm a huge proponent of us actually really inventorying what we have in terms of catch basins and, and manholes and, and, and a lot of these, um, these infrastructure pieces that are part of our stormwater system. So we can kill two birds with one stone by having that inventoried in a database, in a GIS, where our public works guys can then just you know, they're, they're, what's fantastic is our, our public works guys are really excited about the prospect of, of using GIS so they can just do their job more efficiently where if they have a, a database and the info accessible via an iPad, you know, they know exactly when they go onto a street where are the catch basins and, you know, that would all be done through GPS coordinates. I'd just like to refer to page 72 of the annual report for MS4. There are 72 pages in the annual report for MS4 to the government. It's amazing. That was the reference. So our, um, uh, the head of our building department, Brian Arms, is our MS4 officer. And then we also have our planner, David Gilmore, who's very involved in, in the, um, the execution of this, this plan and making sure what we approve is is actually useful and not just checking a box. Um, it's been nice. We've gotten really positive feedback from the county who said that we're ahead of other communities. Um, I think because we're actually doing this because we, we want to do it, not because we have to do it. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that because when I looked at this uh, report that we have before us, uh, I saw the box no circled or filled in many times. Uh, for example, do you have a, a GPS system that tracks? No. Uh, do you have any electronic devices that track? Is it? No. So uh, I was noticing the number of no's uh, and wondering uh, how we could be so favorably. Uh, well, I think we're only two years into it. We're so only, it's OK. Yeah. And I think those also might be considered goals. Um, they're not necessarily a requirements to be compliant, but our, our what I see happening is is our our village government surpassing those even the the, the expectations you know in terms of that checklist. Happy and, to hear that. And that. And I, as you, I I was exhausted just looking at this. Um, okay, item twelve, the <laughs> next steps <laughs> memo. <laughs> So our planner is going to give us a brief presentation 
about the uh, technical assistance grant that we were awarded in the fall um, from the EPA and the EPA came to <coughs> New Paltz and they, they met with various community stakeholders and helped us craft a, a, a plan that we should consider adopting as policy and it had a lot of good stormwater uh, management suggestions and a lot of that had to do with um, how to use green infrastructure. So our planner is investigating, um, you know, whether we should adopt that as formal village board policy. Uh, does that require a CEQA review? Um, so anticipate getting a, a, a resolution um, at an upcoming meeting. Um, but that's all I had on that topic. If anyone has questions? No? Uh, safety committee update? I'm not prepared to give you much more than that. I have spoken to Mr. Bloodgood again, and as you know, I did speak to the folks up in Woodstock. Uh, the supervisor there uh, was very encouraging about going forward with a safety committee. I asked him, well, why? What, what did you get out of doing this? And he said, money. <laughs> That was, his, that was his first and one word answer, money. I said, what do you mean? Of course, I said. And he said, well, there are savings uh, that you realize in your premiums uh, with IMR, New York, uh, MI, right? And uh, that uh, indeed they have found ways in which uh, they have saved money by not having accidents or mishaps of one sort or another occur. And I said, well, how much time and effort does it take to do this? He said, not a lot. The, uh, the, the supervisor, a DPW type person, a policeman, there are five people on this board. They meet about once a month. And uh, as they, however, go about their business, they just make notes. Boing over here, right? Why do we still have something that would endanger every person who walks in the room? So someone would make a note about that. Uh, where do we park our vehicles? Do we park them? Why did the uh, fire uh, department in Gardner come and suck water out of a hydrant not knowing how to proceed? They make notes and then they have, they meet about once a month and they say, well, what are we going to do about it? And they try to fix it. So they have volunteers and, who do this? No. They're, they're the, the supervisor, a person from DPW, uh, a person from the police department. Uh, so they have a five person uh, committee. They meet once a month and they uh, go over safety concerns. So they would so probably make the suggestion to put padding there? Or change it somehow, right? right? So just the idea that they, they brainstorm a list, yes. and then they're, they, they're like, this is a, a, a problem, and then they brainstorm possible solutions. And then they bring and it, and if it requires a, a vote, then they bring it to the appropriate board for a vote. So it's just that simple. You get the, the police just that chief, simple. DPW, uh, board members and, and, and you sit uh, around that you just you just say once a month or once a quarter we sit around the table and brainstorm MIR likes to have a committee looking at safety issues and where is the money part you save on your premiums your uh, municipal insurance okay. premiums okay and then you save on uh, actions against the uh, the municipality Okay. So who's gonna who's gonna set that up and get those handful of people us. in the room? I said I would check it out, and I'm happy to have checked it out. I think I sent each of you the uh, little handbook. It's not even called a handbook. I, I, it's got a, a, even a less imposing name than handbook. Okay. Uh, so who's who? I, I'll, I'll do this. Who's got to be in the room for this meeting? Is it a monthly meeting or a quarterly? You can it's make up it. Us. That's up to you. It's up what to do you us. suggest? Bi-monthly? Bi-monthly. Okay. As a starter. So bi-monthly. Who do you want in the room? You want police chief? Some police. Fire chief? 
do you want to propose this be a joint town village committee? Have the supervisor and the mayor. You could have the police chief and the fire chief. You probably have to have it to be a joint thing. So if if the town police chief, fire right. chief, if the town supervisor, town. mayor, DPW, and highways. Yeah. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six people. That's enough. Yeah. Six mm -hmm. people sit down once every two months, brainstorm. Okay. Okay, I'll arrange well, it. They have to also be committed to noting issues that arise. Well, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone shows up with, with their issues. Yeah. And then that same group could probably also say, well, well, here's something you could do that shouldn't be too expensive to remedy that, Correct. that thing. And, and, and if it's more complicated, you know, maybe we'll say, you know, maybe bring it back to the boards and be like, wow, you guys should really spend money on fixing that problem. Okay, I, and Mr. I'm on it. Mr. I got Mr. Bloodgood would come here to address us if we care to have him. Who's Mr. Bloodgood? He is the representative of the insurance company. And if they brought in equipment to cut out that piece of wood there, maybe they could drill holes in these tables. <laughs> like, like, they might, be able, to, they might be able to do like a brain-sized uh, <laughs> cutout. Be safe. Yeah. You know, that would be more dangerous. <laughs> That's not exactly risk management. <laughs> okay. 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 And with, with that group, I, um, the six, group of six, I, I would say our designee of that person because the, the chiefs may want to send someone else. The, like the fire chief? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we'll leave it. What? We'll leave it up They're, to them. Yeah. They can, they can send yeah. whoever. As long as they have police and fire representation. And we can do the same thing with DPW and highway. Yeah. Yeah. I'll... I'll I'll send a, a note. I'll send an evite. Yes. <laughs> so I, I will communicate with Mr. Bloodgood, and uh, I'll tell him that it's not required that he come and address us. Uh, but if he wants to send us any additional information that he believes would be useful, do you think he should? Do you think maybe he should uh, address that group the first time? Maybe they meet? that might be a, a wise thing. Yeah. So let's do that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, I'll, I'll include need, him on the e-flight. Do we need to move that we create a safety committee, or do you want to research what, how the committee would be composed? Before I say we, we move to create it. That seems fine. I second your motion. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll vote for it. I think I'd rather know what it is before I vote for it, but I have confidence. No, I think this is it. We just discussed what it is. It's just okay. this informal brainstorming group. And then if they come no, up formal with... Formal brainstorming. It's formal, yeah. but no, they can't do they can't do anything. No, the, any no. anything they come up with, um, they have Still to go back action. to their board. Right. Yeah, so that's that's all it is. Okay. Well, I voted a okay. Okay, so we have that, Ryan. It's a committee. We just formed a, a committee. committee. We formed a committee. Right. Um, okay, so this uh, this pro proposed town and village planning board information matrix. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. Uh, this was uh, done by the school district. Mm -hmm. This is for their um, their capital project, and I, I thought this was really a fantastic way of of sharing with the public different projects. So um, I give Supervisor Bertez all the because I, I was thinking I, I was just complimenting uh, the superintendent on. What goes this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is done this by both Okay, okay. This is where it came from. Gotcha, gotcha. So it was actually they don't look the same. Neil's idea to why don't we do that for our planning board projects? And and that makes a whole lot of sense for me because I'm regularly asked, like, well, what about uh, you know the CVS project or what about you know the the Barnaby's Church or you know what about you know River to Ridge? Like where it, and just having this this matrix so you you list the project and then there's like certain steps it's like you know application was submitted did the building department say the application was complete or not uh seeker determination public hearings you know etc cetera, etc cetera. it just like and it would help i think the community understand the planning board review process um and and uh you know you don't we wouldn't need to put every single project in this format but just you know, some of the bigger ones that are before our planning board like the net zero project like where is that currently you know they they they're still in kind of the early right. stages of the planning board review um and you know i was just thinking we could um 
commit as both a, a town board and a village board to have our you know five largest projects in like a, a single sheet and you know have it on our websites or on Facebook mm -hmm. or just seems like it would be very easy to maintain and kind of good one-stop shopping to disseminate info and fun too yeah. yeah well actually that's what the superintendent of schools said that so as they complete so it's like the doozine roof yeah. you know where is it uh, along in the, the process and she said that they're really excited about figuring out well who gets to you know mark up that arrow to show that it moved a step forward um, so I just, I've, I've, just a funny note I was I was in the office I spent part of my time in the office that that did this and I was in the office one day when we got a call from the director asking for all the sharpies we could bring over <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, Jeannie Holly. Brooker or Holly, Holly. Brooker yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it was, because I asked uh, Maria Rice, I said, who came up with this? I think it's so clever, and she, she said Holly Brooker. Um, and then, uh, next item, monthly retainer for legal services versus hourly rate for our village attorney, Will Frank. Um, so what Nancy, our treasurer, would like to do versus just getting a bill for the number of hours. She's really a, a proponent of um, paying a, a, a set monthly fee. And right now she, so the, the proposal that we received from, from Attorney Frank was 275 hours at, um, for an annual cost of 57,750. So that works out to $210 per hour or $4,812.50 per month. So what Nancy likes is the idea that every month she's got to pay um, $4,812.50 and then um, the number of hours that are used that just gets ticked away from that 275. And then if we go over that 275 in the future, the amount changes to uh, $2.00 I'm sorry, $205 per hour over the 275. So the thinking is, you know, some months you might be light in terms of the amount of hours that you use, and then the next month you're, you're heavy, so you don't really have to worry about, you know, the, the size of the monthly bill because it's, it's the set amount. Um, but she wants to uh, return to that retainer formula where we're paying a, a set monthly amount um, now because as of um, I guess it was fiscal year starting on June 1st of 2015 we already surpassed the 250 hours so now we're paying the hourly so our monthly bills are are unpredictable right. you know it could be light it could be small um, so I wanted to make a motion that we go along with uh, what Nancy has suggested and what our attorney has proposed in terms of a monthly retainer of $4,812.50 um, for the next 275 hours. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Friendly to uh, you know the treasurer being able to budget, and I, I think that's a good suggestion on Nancy's part. Um, the uh, what this discussion uh, brought to light is that uh, we have um, a pretty serious increase uh, year to year in the amount of <coughs> total funds, annual funds that we pay to attorneys, and I uh, I just uh, I'm a little a little concerned to see the amount, the degree of the increase, and we can I guess. There's no, no criticism there, I'm just that it's a, the numbers have grown, and I wonder if there's some way we can control that moving forward. Or maybe we've just been busier, and you know, I know last year there was, a, there was legal action between the mayor at that time and the, and the board, and that was expensive. I just, I just wonder you know, why we're seeing such high costs uh, this year compared to other years, and whether they will continue. And whether that's a question that can even be answered.
Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's really, you know, the cost of, of doing business in terms of, um, you know, we need legal representation. Everything that we do when we draft a document needs to be reviewed by our attorney. Um, when we have issues, we need to, you know, check in with our attorney. Yeah, and I, I sincerely mean that. I'll say it again. There is no implied criticism in the question. I, it's just the number has almost doubled from two years ago, and I, you know, that's that's something that any line in the budget I would I would look at. So, um, what numbers are you referring to? Two years ago was less. Which fiscal year? Well, I asked the the treasurer. If she she sent us an email. Set him down. Set him okay. down. We don't have to have a long discussion about this. I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention since uh, I wasn't aware of it and maybe we weren't aware of it. And so that's all. Um, but I, I'm going to go other? to the Okay. So I, I think I have a motion on the floor to change the, the retainer, and, and uh, I'd like to uh, maybe just modify it a little bit. Um, so will it uh, be in effect Feb 1 or March 1? I think the plan was to have it in effect Feb 1. So can, we can act uh, retroactively, can yeah. we? But we haven't been billed yet for February. And I, th I believe both Nancy and Will were fine with that. Works for me. Okay, so did it, do I have a second? I'll second. second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item is uh, we're looking for an approval to waive a sign fee of $250 for the Gardens and Nutrition so folks. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the Long Path Trail Committee wants to use our space. They even provided their own um, insurance liability document. Yep. So I'd like to motion that we accept their application to use our, our building. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we have three trainings. Our building department um, is looking to uh, um, do some, some training. Um, you see the, the items listed here. One of them is related to floodplain management. Um, there's another training at, at the cost of $300 per person. That's a three-day training that Bryant Arms and Rich Travis would attend. And then um, the other thing is related to, the other training is related to uh, FEMA levy training. So moved. So. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Okay, next item is, we discussed this last time, this sales tax revenue split between the town and the village. Um, I was thinking it would be useful to have more of a paper trail. So if, if the town of New Paltz is currently receiving $250,000 in sales tax revenue from the county, um, and that goes into the town's aid fund, which serves um, Townwide residents, including the the folks that we represent who live in the the, the neighborhood, also known as the village. Um, the the thinking would be: let's have a, a paper trail that says you know, X percent of that, for example purposes, two hundred fifty thousand dollars goes towards the the village residents um, into that town A fund. Um, and, and I discussed this the last time how, um, you know, when you, you when I was reading in the newspaper about the um, discussions in terms of county uh, sales tax revenue being shared amongst the, the 20 towns, uh, the newspaper article was saying, you know, 20 towns receive sales tax revenue and two of the three villages in the county also receives sales tax revenue, so Sargates and Ellenville do, so that it implies that the village of New Paltz does not. But for all intents and purposes, we do, our residents do receive that revenue because it goes into the town's A fund. 
So I don't, I don't think it really makes a whole lot of sense if we split up that money and asked for the county to send us a check directly and then to send a separate check for a lesser amount to the town. But let's just have a, a formal recognition that some of that money that the county is sending to the town is for village residents. Um, so, you know, whether, I think it would probably just be like a, uh, an MOU between the town and the village. Um, and my suggestion would be to split the amount based on the population differences of the the number of folks in the village versus the number of folks in the town outside the villages and we could you know just reference census data so it's just like really black and white you know use in this situation 2010 census data and then every 10 years it's it's updated so it's not a complicated formula i think generally you have to do this one of two ways you either use assessed value or you use population data and I, I'm in favor of using population data um, for, for this purpose. Any questions, in comments? The, the two instances, uh, in the two instances that you cited, Ellenville and Saugerties, Saugerties uh, is there a particular reason why they were, uh, why their arrangements are different and they receive monies independently? I don't, I don't know the history of their arrangements, but I, I, I believe uh, both former may mayors Jason and Terry have looked at this from the village of New Paltz perspective, and um, and it, it's it, it you know it's like we, we could you know wrestle and, and try to say you know we want a different arrangement, um, but I actually feel like just recognizing that some of that money is earmarked for village residents is is probably a a cleaner way to to go about making sure that the the village is represented represented in this Fine. this revenue. Okay. Um, so, Councilperson Dan Torres was going to explore a draft MOU with the town attorney on this topic, and we'll circulate that when we get it. Right. No other update. Um, Okay, we need to, um, the last time we were looking at the, uh, the proposed policy refinements regarding NBR, and we had the, the seeker documentation in front of us, um, it's pretty straightforward because, you know, all we're looking to do is to declare uh, negatively the environmental impacts. So the, the forms actually were, were correct in that, um, you know, it said, you know, if there are no significant impacts, move on to page two. So that there was a whole um, section of the form that was left blank, and I think mm -hmm. that was confusing. So um, I'm very comfortable with us making a motion to to uh, accept accept that. Uh, do we have to do that via a roll call? Do we have that paperwork? Does anyone have their their packet with them? Yes. Yeah. You're asking for the minutes, or no? Was it a roll call at the two th uh, the the February tenth meeting? I seem to recall it was. Well, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just uh, just do a roll call? Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we um, move forward with the uh, the 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 seeker action regarding the the two NBR refinements and that we're declaring a negative declaration. And have we gotten clarity on the? Yeah, okay. I mentioned that when you're out okay. of the room. Yeah, so, excuse me, okay. Yeah, right. I, I don't mind repeating it. Just that, so if you go to the, the first page of the, the form, yep. um, see where it says like box number two, I think it says yep. if, you know, if, if this is a negative declaration, just skip to page or section two. Gotcha. So that's why there are all those blank boxes. Okay. So it does look incomplete, but it actually was correct. Thank you. Trustee Young? Aye. Deputy Mayor Rockford? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Trust, 
Trustee Rocco. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Okay. Um, next item um, was something that I added to the agenda. Um, I was speaking, I actually I got a, a, a note from a, a resident who was concerned about the quality of the road in front of the, the old Barnabys, and I couldn't agree more. Like yeah. when, you, when you think of that section um, heading north on 32 on the, um, the east side of the street, the road condition is terrible. Um, so I, I reached out to Gail Gallery, the, the chair of the Transportation Implementation Committee, and she said that she would gladly approach DOT with, uh, with that concern, but she thought it would be prudent if I reached out to, to Blue and Chris Marks just to see if they had any other road surfaces that, that, uh, that annoyed them. That were, that were state roads that we have no control over. And um, so we added, to, we added one other, one other uh, location. Blue said that the section of Main Street, basically in front of McGillicuddy's and Gourmet Pizza, so that's heading eastbound on Main Street between Platic Hill and 208, he said is in um, poor condition. So Gail's suggestion was for for our board to send a note to the um, DOT maintenance residency in Kingston, formally asking them to fix those roads. And Blue and I discussed that, and he agreed that a, a note from the board makes more sense than just him picking up the phone and saying, hey, DOT, please fix our roads. So I, I was just looking for um, support from the board to draft a, a note and ask them to ask DOT to, to fix those roads. So moved. So supported. Okay. Um, so supported. <laughs> just a quick thing. Um, would that be ending at 208 on Main Street or including the intersection? Uh, my understanding is, uh, wait, ending Main? My, my understanding is that we're, now if you want to um, modify what how this ask is articulated, I'm totally for that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my understanding is basically we're going to ask for something, and if we're lucky, we get a crumb. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. let's ask for exactly what we want. So how do you want to word it? I, I would say including the intersection at 208, 32, and 299. Okay. Because you can see the um, the old. Um, what are those things called? The cable car yeah, lines? Yeah, the trolley yeah. tracks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you know where you can also see some some weird underground electronical mechanicals is is right there in front of the the post office parking lot, like that that same intersection right. as you go a little bit westbound. If you look, like there's some, there's it seems like there's like exposed wires. So I, I will add that to yeah. okay. to our request. Exposed no. wires sounds like an issue for a safety committee. <laughs> <laughs> I think they took out a, uh, a telephone booth at that location over the past couple of years. I don't know whether that's the, the whatever wire. But these are. wires are like in the middle of the street. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Not a good place to make your calls. <laughs> so trees for trips. Did, did everyone see the note that... Um, David sent around actually just today where I think he was brainstorming on a few ideas mm -hmm. for you know where we could ask the trees for tubes program to consider doing some plantings and yeah, I shared that with shade tree commission just in case they have some ideas yeah they're the tree people so I, I just wanted uh, you know sign off from our board that David's going to put in an application so we'll leave it up to him and and you know, he'll hear from Shade Tree and, and they'll come up with a nice list and make a, a, a request. And we're, we're all good with, with yeah, that. I, yes. I, yeah. I had also, um, in an email today, I did also add Rachel Lagodka, um, just knowing um, she, over the past number of years, has done a lot of studies in, um, along the Millbrook, Millbrook Preserve area. 
Um, so she might know of other areas within there that um, would be good for this project. She, she would go in um, with student groups and doing studies of um, the wildlife in there and everything else. I think she might know specific areas in there that uh, the rest of us would be unaware of. Great, so I'll, I'll encourage David to also um, make sure he's touched base with, with Rachel. Um, next item was to uh, move bills and claims. Second. All in, second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, we now have exact session. We're just waiting for our attorney. Do we have a- Half hour uh, to 45 minutes. Do we have a joint meeting set, date set for any time in the future? We can't do that ourselves, but since we have a few minutes to talk. Do you want to look at calendars and we'll maybe- so. uh, yeah. yeah, and just so everyone knows, uh, the last email that we received from our attorney, he was expecting to arrive between 9.30 and 9.45. Uh -oh. And it's nine o'clock. <laughs> He's coming from um, an event uh, where his kid is performing, so he told me that his we came second. It was a big. It was a big ask to come for him to come out at all. Recess the box. <laughs> Anyhow, oh, we could Not do it. Is, right? We could do an executive session there because we can't be on camera. But then we have to run back here and adjourn. No, we bring Ryan with us. <laughs> oh, it's true. And you're, yeah, he lives right upstairs. Right from upstairs. <laughs> when do you guys want to have a joint meeting? Next one here or at the town? It's our turn. Okay. It's our turn to host. You want to include us to the second meeting in uh, March? What? Want to invite them to the second meeting in March? <laughs> the ninth? Or no, no the, the second, second, second sorry. Yeah, just, just give people the time to The 23rd. Time. Sure. Correct. Yeah, 23rd. So you want to float that to your colleagues? Yeah. 323? Perhaps. Okay. I guess you, you guys would have to agree to it publicly, right? Yeah, so I mean, what I would say is if you guys are here with that, why not you vote to have yeah. a joint meeting contingent on the town also mm -hmm. pass the summer motion? Yeah. Good thought. So I'm making a motion that we have a joint meeting on March 23rd at Village Hall to commence at 7 p.m., assuming that the town board agree, you know, agrees to accept our invitation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Ryan, can you make sure that gets sent to our town board colleagues to see if they're available? Alrighty. May I suggest that uh, we take a break? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna take up smoking like the last board, you know, so I didn't have a cigarette. Oh <laughs> Just, what do we do with time like this? 